Thanks for tuning in to The Ordinary Filmmaker. Subscribe to get notification of new videos like this one so you don't miss any news, rumors, gear reviews, or tutorials. And a big thanks to Atomos for sponsoring The Ordinary Filmmaker. I'm using the Ninja 5 external recorder for all my studio work as it really does save me an awful lot of time in post. So if you want to speed up your projects in post, consider using my links down below to purchase your own Ninja and also help support the channel at the same time. And now, for a quick recap of this week's news. If you want a full news breakdown of the stories I'm talking about, well, watch the video indicated in the picture in picture. This week started off with news of a, well, several new Canon RF glass that would be arriving at the end of April. We can expect to see the 100mm f2.8 and the 400-600mm and f4. Tuesday, we got word from Canon rumors that Canon has certified another R system camera. Will this new camera be announced alongside the new lenses at the end of the month? We'll just have to wait and see. SEPA announced camera sales numbers Wednesday showing that the camera market has stabilized in February. Now, is this a long-term trend or just a blip? Only time will tell as 2020 and 2021 are far from normal years. We discovered a global shutter patent. It appears that Canon has solved an issue related to high noise. I'd expect to see a global shutter in the Canon EOS R1, but we'll just have to wait on that one as we're not expecting an announcement until later this year. Sony announced two cameras this week, the A7R3A, not Alpha, and the A7R4A. It's just, these names are strange. I'm still a little bit surprised by these cameras and the updates are relatively minor. The biggest change is that the new cameras, well, they get a 2.4 million dot LCD and a few other changes. Well, two months after we get the Alpha 1 with its much smaller 1.44 million dot LCD. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure what Sony's marketing at here. And these are not out or these are not Astro cameras. I've looked into all the marketing material, everything that came out from Sony. And these just appear to be a minor upgrade over the previous ones. But still, if you had bought the Alpha 1, how would you feel about these new minor updates getting a much bigger screen? I don't know about you, but I'd feel a little bit bummed. Still, no news on the much anticipated A7 IV. On Thursday, Canon announced the discontinuation of 13 EF lenses. There shouldn't be any doubt about Canon's future. It's mirrorless, and it's about the R system. The big news Friday was that one-shot filmmaker won the spring challenge. He gets an Angelbird 512GB CF Express card and card reader along with an ordinary filmmaker baseball cap. The four runner-ups will also get an ordinary filmmaker baseball cap, but I've yet to see the addresses for each of these people. Please reach out to me on Facebook and provide me with your full name, address, and phone number so that I can give you your own baseball cap. Remember, these are only for the final five entries to get the baseball cap. Now, if you'd still like to get a baseball cap, an ordinary filmmaker baseball cap that is, go to ordinaryfilmmaker.com where you can purchase one for $34.99. Like staying informed and learning about camera gear? Well, subscribe and choose all notifications so you get notified as soon as I publish a video. But now, it's time to answer your questions. Got a question for next week's video? Post it in the questions down below, sorry, post it in the comment section down below, and I might be answering your questions next week. And now, for our first question. Renee asks, Hi, I'm a photographer and wanted to venture out into the video world. What software is needed and easy to use for a beginner? How does audio and video sync? Total newbie here, thanks. Now, when it comes to easy to edit software, I gotta say one of the easiest pieces of software to use is iMovie. Now, if you happen to have an Apple device, whether it be an iPhone, an iPad, a MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, or any type of Macintosh, iMovie comes free, and it's pretty good for getting started. It's pretty simple to use, and they give you a lot of sound effects, a lot of different templates that you can use. But if you don't have an Apple, and you're on Windows or Linux, well, then you do have other choices. You can look at getting LumaFusion. You can look at Movie Maker, although I wouldn't really use that. It's a little bit too basic. This is where we start to get into some more complicated software, such as uh, DaVinci Resolve. I think DaVinci Resolve is absolutely terrific, and you can get it for free for the basic version. Uh, it still gives you an awful lot of features to work with, but it isn't necessarily the easiest to work with, and that's why I like iMovie. I find the simplicity of it, how easy it is to use. Um, it, it's not a problem whatsoever. Now, one thing you did mention here, I see you're talking about how does audio and video sync. Well. I, I need to find out a bit more from you. Are you recording directly from a camera, such as a Canon R5, um, a Sony a6100? 
because if you are then the audio is being recorded with the video and there's nothing extra you have to do but if you're recording the way I am I'm recording with my Canon R5 I'm actually using a Ninja 5 so it's even more complicated so my video is stored on the Ninja 5 and it also does record audio as well but it's not very good it sounds terrible as you can hear right now this is what my audio sounds like coming directly out of the Ninja because well I'm not using any microphone that's better so we turn back on the Tascam mic this is the microphone that I use for pretty well all of my video it's capturing just my voice here and as we move further and further away from the mic any other sounds are cut out so any sort of room echo that I'm getting here in the basement which is much reduced due to the insulation or any other noises that are made upstairs are much reduced so I need to find out from you are you recording from multiple um, microphones and if you are it's it's not a big deal there's an option you can use in software that's called synchronize audio so what you do is you select your video clip you select your audio clip together and then you choose from the options Synchronize audio and Final Cut Pro there's an option I think it's right under the file menu you just go down and choose synchronize audio it's pretty simple uh, but taking a look at your question again see there's really one piece of software that jumps out to me right away and that's iMovie I, I, I've used it before um, and I used it for about six months before I finally to go, decided to go with Final Cut Pro uh, one thing is if you do start using iMovie and you get better and better and you decide you want to grow your next automatic inclination is to Final Cut Pro which is basically a pro version of iMovie and it really is a pro version people make cinematic movies with it but if you want to think of where you want to eventually go down the road and that's one thing that's important too see I don't know if you're just planning on shooting a few family videos and that's all you're going to do you're not doing any hour-long movies you're doing basically five minute or ten minute videos you want it simple all the time you're not looking at doing advanced color grading or adding LUTs or or doing any special effects then you know what something like iMovie works very very well it's very simple it's very easy to use you're limited you can only have two tracks of video which for me is a limiting factor sometimes I have as many as five and no not not all the time that I'm using video sometimes I'll lay photos over top and so from my view I really like iMovie I think it's terrific but I really like the products from DaVinci Resolve too and while they're a little complicated to start out with if you just try doing the basics you just try editing it's pretty simple to use and then as you decide you want to grow you can turn on and use features such as um, you know you can start practicing color grading or um, um, color balancing and what starts to happen is you'll get to a certain video and you'll just say you know what the, the colors aren't right here and then you'll start looking on YouTube okay how do I color balance using iMovie or how do I color balance using um, uh, DaVinci Resolve so um, yeah iMovie I'd say is up at the top but then I you know for as you start to get better at things I really think Final Cut Pro is terrific and my second best option would be DaVinci Resolve I think DaVinci Resolve is very good I would personally stay away from Adobe products because I find that they're very expensive for what you get and they're not necessarily the the fastest and most efficient but Renee if you can let me know are you using a Mac are you using Windows uh, let me know in the comment section down below and I can better tailor my response to you SM asks how do you shoot C-Log properly editing is one thing but getting the exposure right can be difficult white balance as well uh, yes the first time using any sort of log profile um, you know what I discovered the same thing and I felt like I was bashing my head against the wall now I've been doing this a while so whenever I go ahead and I want to bash my head against a wall I pick a nice cement wall I get a nice juicy lemon I put it right here and I tape it around my head so at least when I bash my head against the wall I can at least taste the sweet sour defeat it's a lot more palatable but that being said the here's what I recommend doing let me using LUTs okay you didn't mention so I'm going to assume that you might be using LUTs first of all don't use LUTs because this seems to be a characteristic when you're using a lot the first time using log profile you throw a lot in and it doesn't seem to work so log footage isn't really any different from any other footage in terms of the first thing you want to do is you want to do your color balance or white balance that's one of the most important things you want to do now for me it's very simple in a scene like this because I've got a very sort of medium gray table here but when I'm out shooting a lot of times my son has gray pants and that's kind of architected because I can color balance against his gray pants 
Um, sometimes I'll color balance against stuff in the scene. Uh, a concrete sidewalk balances really well. Certain tree bark will balance really well. So you want to get your balance done right. Now once you've got your balancing done right, then it's time to look at your color wheels and to see, you know, where's your light falling? Do you need to adjust the shadows a little bit? Do you need to adjust the highlights a little bit? And usually once you've figured out those two, then you can adjust your midtones if you need to. So if you find out your subject is a little bit too dark, then raise up your midtones a little bit, and usually that's all going very nicely. So what have we done here? Well, first of all, we've done a color balance or white balance to make sure our colors are right. Then we go ahead and adjust the shadows, the highlights, and the midtones. And most often I'm just maybe adjusting the shadows a little bit, I'm adjusting the highlights a little bit, and maybe the midtones. It really depends on the footage I'm shooting. Then, and only then, adjust the saturation. And what this will do, it'll bring the color back, it'll make things look vibrant once again. These are the three steps. And do you know what? I haven't used a lot in over a year. I just, I fiddled around with them last year and I found that, you know what? I could do a better job, I could get the look I want without using a lot. Now, that being said, if you do want to use a lot, well, go ahead and use a lot, bring it in. But keep in mind that when you bring a lot into your software, you can choose the strength at which it is applied. Now, I've taken um, footage right out of the camera and I've applied the Canon R5 um, Canon Log 1 LUT and that was okay. And, and then here's the thing is I fought, found I was fighting with it more often than not. And I found that when I didn't apply the LUT, I actually got better. It, it just looked more natural. And now that I'm shooting with C-Log 3 on the Canon R5 with firmware 1.3.0, and yes, um, if you're worried about going up to 1.3 right now, well, wait, because a lot of people are having troubles. I personally am not. I've shot quite a bit of video. I shot, um, not Thanksgiving, I shot Easter last weekend, and I got some really good results. Right out of camera, things look pretty good. My only problem is I'm working off a really small screen here, so I, I can't really judge the colors as well, even with my glasses. I need to make my changes, I look at the scopes, I publish it, and then I sort of get a better eye looking on my large screen TV. But to sum up, when you want to edit log footage, balance it first. And once you've got your balance right and you're happy with it, then go ahead and adjust your shadows, then your highlights, then your midtones. And only once you've done that, then go ahead and adjust your saturation. And you're gonna find you're gonna get much better results. Um, also, let me know what you're editing with. Are you shooting with the R5? Are you shooting with C-Log1? Are you shooting with Sony's log? Are you shooting with Panasonic log? Let me know a bit more information because depending on what you're shooting with, I might tailor my answer just a little bit differently. Rumor has it asks, I know some changes in your audio between videos. Are you testing mics? No, I'm not. Um, I don't know why there would be any difference. The settings that I've been using, I'm using the task cam with every video, and on the bottom, I don't, well, let's see if I can bring it out here without causing any static. On each task cam, I have a, a, a little bit of sticky tape here so I know which one to use, so I'm using the same task cam every time. So I get the same settings there. And then when I go into the computer, I adjust it the same each time. First of all, the audio coming out of the Ninja, I delete. And then I synchronize the, or I synchronize the audio, then I delete the audio out of the Ninja. And then I usually add about 5 dB because of the, um, I'm not using the limiter here. I, I find that when I bring up another 5 dB, it gives me a pretty good audio level. So yeah, I'm not testing anything. And the only other thing I th that perhaps could be different is sometimes I'm editing on the M1 Mac and sometimes I'm editing on a much older Intel-based Mac. So I don't know if the, the hardware has any impact. It really shouldn't, but... Yeah, I'm not testing mics, honest. Scott Lee asks, do you think the R5 will drop considerably in price with the release of the R5C? Well, Scott, I was going to answer this question myself, but John Drummond reached out to me and said, Simon, if you don't mind, I would like to take a stab at that question. So, over to you, John. Thanks, Simon. Hi, everyone. I'm John Drummond. I'm a nature photographer from Queens, New York City. And I'm here to answer Scott's question about the R5C and whether its release will result in a price drop for the Canon R5, which currently retails for about $38.99. Now, so happens I'm a long-time Canon shooter. I've had a number of DSLRs over the years, and just two days ago, I bought my own R5. But I assure you that my opinion on this subject will have nothing to do with my any hope that I have that I did, that I did not overpay for this camera. 
No, we won't have any influence by any such hope on my part. Now, as a longtime Canon shooter, I've had a number of camera bodies over the years. Last summer, I bought the R6 that I'm filming this video on right now, and in early 2018, I bought a 5D Mark IV. Okay. So as I was saying, in January 2018, I bought myself a 5D Mark IV. I paid about $32.99 for this, not knowing that by the end of 2018, uh, Canon was going to jump into the mirrorless market with the EOS R, uh, which while it did get panned to some degree uh, just by comparison to the Sony E7 III, the fact is that the EOS R is in most ways actually really a better camera than the 5D Mark IV, being mirrorless and having all the technical advantages that mirrorless uh, uh, full-frame bodies have. Um, and as a result of that, early, by early 2019, the 5D Mark IV dropped in price at least $300. And in fact, right now, as I, can, as I speak, you can get one brand new for $24.99, the same price as the R6 goes for. Now, why is that? Because of the EOS R5 as well as the R6 having been released last summer. Now, cameras tend to drop in price, at least from Canon's side, when the camera that succeeds it is a significant uh, improvement and, in fact, is, is eventually going to be replacing the current model. And that's the case with the, with, the, uh, with the R5. It has a bigger sensor, it's got faster burst speed, it has a huge number of, you know, got better ergonomics, it's just got a whole bunch of stuff that I'm only going to go into. But one thing, of course, that I have, do have to go into with the R5 is this video, because it's so much better a video machine than the uh, 5D Mark IV, and that's one of the, and that's how Canon marketed it. They marketed it as a video-first camera, which was their mistake, uh, seeing as we know that it's a phenomenal stills camera, but it does overheat in 8K and in 4K 60, as well as high quality 4K. So. Uh, they got raked over the coals, and probably rightly so, because they really mismarketed the, the R5, as great a camera as it is. But their plan is to correct that mistake by releasing the R5C. Now, what we know about the R5C is that, in performance, it's going to be virtually identical to the R5. According to Canon rumors, which I'll put up here, um, the R5C uh, is expected to have the same burst rate, the same sensor, the same video performance, you know, shoot 8K 30, 4K 120, and with the latest firmware updates, it's going to shoot um, 1080 at 120, you know, and pretty much all the same stuff. Not really anything technically better than the R5 uh, does right now, with the exception that it won't overheat. And how it's not going to overheat is um, by having an active cooling system. I just realized I've been waving around the 5D Mark IV instead of the, R, instead of the R5. But in any case, yeah, so the R5C is going to have an active uh, cooling system that's going to be a, a fan, uh, air intakes, uh, in and out, um, probably also a better heat sink. In fact, I looked up uh, an article in techradar.com, which I'll put some clips up here about. Um, basically, techradar.com indicates that uh, from their analysis, it should probably have a system similar to the Sony FX3. Uh, and that would include also a copper uh, heat sink instead of the magnesium heat sink that the camera has now. Magnesium being much, much lighter, but also much less conducive than copper. So when you put all that together, the R5C is going to be a bigger, heavier camera and with less weather sealing because of the fact that it has to have air vents so in compared to the R5. So you put all that together and what do you get? You get a Canon R5C. That's the same thing as an R5, except it won't catch on fire. When, it, uh, when, it's, when you're shooting 8K or high quality 4K. Um, it's going to have the same burst speed, the same sensor, the same, same this, the same that, same everything, except it won't overheat. Now, that's going to be important if you're a video, professional videographer, but maybe not so important if you're like me and you mainly shoot stills and, you, and if you do video, you're going to be doing like short clips and probably not shooting 4K, uh, 8K. Um, so would I need a four, uh, an R5C? No. Would you, Scott, need an R5C? Maybe, because I don't know what you do. But will it result in a price drop? I kind of don't think so because it's not a, it, the R5C does not sound to me like a technically enough big jump that's going to make the R5 uh, drop in price. Uh, people who are going to want the R5 should probably still get an R5. Uh, based on my own experience, of course, in terms of the time in the market, you're probably going to take what I just said and go the other way. But in my opinion, the R5C is not going to affect the R5 pricing anytime soon after uh, release. It's just not enough better camera to really do that. Thanks. Thanks a lot, John, for answering this question. And guys, please do uh, give John a visit. John's a landscape photographer, and he does some really great work. He's got a lot of videos, and he's constantly published them. 
I think he publishes videos almost as often as I do. So go ahead and take a look at his channel and please subscribe. Let's see if we can't get him over that 1,000 subscriber mark. But to, as a follow-up to what John was saying, um, I do agree with him. We are not going to see a price break on the Canon EOS R5. If you are looking for a deal on the EOS R5, well, probably Black Friday is your best time. And that happens right around, what, November? Um, last year, we got some deals around November, but we didn't get anything on the R5 or the R6. Actually, except for Australia. Australia got some deals, which is bizarre. So Australia had some deals last year. And then in December, we didn't see many deals. But if you're living in Canada, the price of the Canon EOS R5 is dropped by about $200. And no, Canon isn't playing favorites. When the R5 was first launched, the Canadian dollar was at 70 cents to the US dollar. It's now at 80 cents to the US dollar. So simply what Canon Canada has done is they've gone ahead and reevaluated the prices based on foreign exchange. Adbag asks, do you think the GH5 is still the best all around camera for filmmaking in 2021? What do you think about the G85 and the M50 for hybrid camera in 2021? Preferably for product or street photography videography. Um, well, that's a very good question. Now, I'm going to answer you honestly. Now, to me, I don't think the GH5, for me, it wasn't the best all-around camera, or I would have bought it back around 2018, 2019. I think the GH5 is still a very solid camera, but for a lot of us that do require um, accurate autofocus, it's not for you. But if you're doing studio work, if you're doing work where the subject isn't moving around a lot, the GH5 still offers value. But here's my problem recommending the GH5. The GH6 is imminent. The GH6 was supposed to be coming out last year, right around August. And then, well, they decided to postpone it. We don't know when it's coming out. It's probably going to come out this year, but would you want to buy the GH5 knowing the GH6 is coming out? I would certainly want to hold off, and here's two reasons why. If you're looking for improvements, well, then you probably want to get the GH6. And if you're looking for getting a deal, you probably want to wait for the GH6 because the GH5 will come down in price. Now, in terms of other hybrid cameras, what do I recommend, the M50 or the G85? It's really tough. Now, as always, if you've got a lot of inventory in either Canon or Panasonic, then you're probably better off buying Canon or Panasonic based on whatever your inventory is. But in terms of best hybrid camera, well, when it comes to the M50, I'm not... Yeah, I'm not really excited about the M50 because it's their EFM platform. And unless Canon does some sort of a pivot with it, they haven't really given us much indication on where their roadmap is. Now, what they have indicated quite clearly on many occasions is that they're focusing on the R system. That means bodies, that means lenses. They're trying to get caught up with the competition. Because up until recently, Canon's being, been a company of DSLRs. Look at 2019, they had what, 4.86 million units sold of DSLRs and only, what, 900,000 in mirrorless? So I would be hesitant to look at the M50. And if I was going to look at Canon's mirrorless line, I'd probably compare it to the M6 Mark II. And the G85? Well, look, here, here, add back, here, here's, here's my outlook here. Um, in starting around 2020, we've seen a huge... Um, amount of innovation in cameras. Look at the R5, look at the R6, the, Can the Sony A7S III, the Alpha 1. We're starting to see companies really throw in a lot more capability. It's like we're getting to that next stage. So if the G85 or the M50 the, or the, even the GH5 gives you all the capabilities that you need, then they're the right cameras for you. But to say one camera is better than the other, that's not something I like to do because that might work for one person. It doesn't mean it works for everybody else. And so, as I've said in the past, you really want to identify what are the capabilities you want in a camera and then score them against the cameras you're looking at and see, okay, well, maybe in this case, the G85 is better, the GH5 is better, or the M6 Mark II. But that being said, I think a refresh of the GH6 is due this year. I mean, it's certainly due. It's, it's coming sooner than later. And when you see all the other cameras coming out, and even look at the S5, look at what the S5 is able to do. So, yeah. Uh, and, and if you've watched my channel an awful lot, you'll know that I generally don't say this camera is better than the other. I usually say what's best for me, or I usually say, you know, look at your the capabilities you're looking for in a camera. And I put out a video back around December the 18th, no, 17th or the 22nd, where I did a detailed review of the Canon EOS R5, and I compared it to the R6 and the EOS R. 
and I listed all the capabilities that I was looking for in a camera. And then I said, based on these capabilities of what I'm looking for, this to me is a better camera or this camera does this capability better. So let me know if that helps. Dai asks, I'm practicing using C-Log3 since the new firmware update. Every time I apply Cinema Gamut LUT for C-Log3, the footage was overexposed looking at the waveform. Even when I exposed the clip properly with extra room for highlights, can you show an example of how to correctly grade C-Log3? I couldn't find much information online. Uh, Dai, I love this question because um, you know, I had some issues with it too. So let's go back to Canon Log 1. Now, if you shot with Canon Log 1, it's a pretty flat profile. So in the R5, you can turn on View Assist, which is in the Log Settings area. And if you turn on View Assist, well, you're, you're, what you're seeing in the LCD is still pretty much desaturated. However, if you shoot with C-Log3 and use View Assist, well, the footage through the LCD is very much oversaturated. So I, I first of all tested it in the house, die, and I moved around. I thought, well, this isn't too bad. Yes, it's a little oversaturated, but how is that any different from some of Canon's entry cam cameras like the Rebel or the 70D, 80D? They seem to be a little bit too saturated with their standard modes. But when I went outside, I found that I just didn't feel like I could trust the view assist. So I turned it off. I, I don't use view assist. I know that my footage is going to be a little bit well, what I'm seeing in the viewfinder isn't going to be accurate. And I could use the Ninja 5, but I'm keeping that as my studio camera. So here's what I do. The first thing I do is I, I adjust the, the zebras. I want to make sure the colors are falling within the right range. Uh, if I'm shooting outside in a sunny day, then I should have pretty much a bell curve, and that's how I like to have things distributed. And I'll shift it around. I'll shift the camera towards the bright area. I'll shift it up to the sky. I just want to get a good overall feel of what the histogram is, is showing me because then I will adjust the ND filters to give me that perfect range. Because when I'm out shooting my son, he's moving around a lot. And I've got to think for any given scene is, what's the exposure going to be like? And I'm going to adjust for the, the, the brightest, brightest that I'm going to be shooting in. Then what I do is, I will turn on my zebras. And what I do is, I, I usually, when I'm doing the run and gun stuff, I'll set my zebras to about 90, 95%. And if I'm seeing any sort of hashing, on my subject, well, I need to obviously adjust the ND filter a little bit more. And that's what I do. Instead of adjusting the f-stop to compensate for exposure, I don't want to do that because I'm using the f-stop to choose my depth of field. And the shutter set to 1 60th because that's what you need to do with video. I let the ISO float, so that leaves me usually with the ND filter to adjust to help with exposure a little bit. Um, but as far as what do you do when you get into post, um, because you're asking me about what cinema gamma LUT do I apply, right? So I want to make sure I cover everything off. I want to cover off the view assist, which is a little bit problematic. It looks overexposed when you're out shooting. So I don't trust that. I turn that off. And now what I want to talk to you about is how to grade it in your post software. Now I use Final Cut Pro and I'm not going to show you any B-roll here because I just want to talk to you very simply. It's really quite simple what I do. The first thing I do is my white balance. I, I color balance. I make sure I get that middle gray. Now, as I said earlier in the video, how I cheat is quite often, if I know I'm filming my son, I'll say, put your gray pants out on there and wear a nice bright shirt or something to brighten things up. And I always auto balance or sorry, manually balance right off his pants. And that usually works very well. And if you're, if you don't have any gray that you're wearing, then I look for other things in the scene to help get that balance right because if you don't it's really going to make things difficult you might have too much green you might have too much red or magenta so you really want to balance first notice i haven't even talked about a lot yet because i don't use LUTs. so what do i do next yeah i don't use LUTs. so what do i do next after i've done the balance well then i look at my color wheels and what i do is i adjust the shadows if i need to and then i look at the highlights and adjust that if i need to and the last thing I do is I adjust the midtones because then I can pretty well get the lighting right. Now, at this point, my footage still looks a little bit washed out. It looks desaturated, and that's normal when shooting with a log curve. And how do I fix that? Well, I just simply bring the saturation back. Now, if you're starting out, you're just practicing with this, then just use the master wheel and just bring up the um, saturation carefully. Look at your reds, your yellows, and your oranges. You want to make sure they're not glowing. Really watch out for those because those, if you increase the saturation too much, can start to look a little wacky and especially for the face, it can really blow things out. So raise that up, 
And if things look a little weird and it, it looks like it's, you know, your shadows don't look right, but your, your highlights are really a bit too bright, then what you're going to need to do is don't use the master, adjust the saturation for the shadows, the highlights, and the midtones separately. But if you're starting out, usually you can just fiddle around with the master and get pretty good results. So, it, it's a misconception that you actually need to apply a LUT to get your log footage back to normal. And you're going to find that if you try going that way, it's going to be a, a fight every different every single time. What you need to do is understand how to get your footage back without using a LUT. Because if you can learn that, if you do that every time, which I do, and you know what, I now find it very simple, especially with C-Log3. C-Log3 is so much easier to grade than C-Log1. So here are my tips. Turn off view assist. Use your histogram and your waveforms, or sorry, the R5 if you don't have waveforms. Use your histograms, use your um, zebras. Uh, if you have other cameras like Panasonic's that have waveforms, use waveforms, use false colors if you have them. You want to make sure that you're not overexposing, clipping your highlights, or the same with the shadows, and the histogram can help you do that. Some cameras just give you the histogram, and that's fine. You want to make sure that on, if you're on a bright sunny day, for example, you should see a bell curve on the histogram because all it's doing is showing you the light values. So move your camera around, make sure they're not bunching up to one end or the other, and adjust your exposure accordingly. Now, once you're in post, color balance. Do it manually. Bring, you know, focus on a medium gray in your frame, and you want to get that perfect because everything you do from there out out won't work if you don't get that right. Then, using your color wheels, adjust your brightness to your shadows, your highlights, and your midtones so you get it just where you need it. And only once you've done that, now you bring up your saturation. Now, I, LUTs can still provide you a certain look, but the thing you have to do before you even start messing around with LUTs is you have to do all the steps I talked about right up to balancing. You're doing your white balance. You've got to get that done right first. Now, when you do bring in a lot and you find that, yeah, it's oversaturated or it's just looking wrong, well, what you can do is you can play around with a lot. First of all, don't bring it in at full strength. Maybe try 50% or 60%. There's usually a slider there that you can adjust, and that will help you. But for most of the work that I'm doing, for most of us ordinary filmmakers, we're filming for our family, and what we're trying to capture is life as it looks. That's why I always shoot at 30 frames per second. And that's why I don't use LUTs because I find that you're going to learn a lot more about your camera if you don't shoot with, or sorry, not shoot with LUTs. If you don't use LUTs in post, do everything manually. And after you've done a couple of videos, you're going to find it's very simple. And then if you want, try adding LUTs and you'll find that you'll be better prepared to handle them and it won't be a struggle every time. And our last question is from Man Friendly Church. I use the green screen when talking in front of it. I usually edit with the green screen showing, then do a render. I add titles and background and edit, and then I do another render. What's the best format to render in after the first edit to make editing quicker and less drop frames? Many file options have sub-options, and after trying several, the only one that I could get to reliably work was MP4, but it's not the best for editing. Okay, a really good question. Now, Paul, what I highly recommend here is that whenever you're doing editing, if you don't have to deal with drop frames and you, any of that sort of stuff, Convert to Apple ProRes 422. Uh, it works very well. Um, usually it's buttery smooth. And with my Ninja 5 here, when I'm recording, I'm outputting to Apple ProRes 422. So I don't have to do any transcoding and I can edit right off the SSD. So it saves me a ton of time. And if you're doing a lot of videos, Paul, this is something you might want to consider. Getting a Ninja so that way, right out of camera, you, you're, you're ready to go with Apple ProRes 422 and you shouldn't have any drop frames whatsoever. And to give you an idea, these M1 Macs, this is an eight gigabyte uh, MacBook Air M1, and I edited 8K video on this. Now, it was in ProRes 422. I converted it to Apple ProRes 422 first, um, and it could edit 8K, no problem. It can edit 4K HQ, no problem. So your editing codec should be Apple ProRes 422. Now, to answer your question about rendering, don't bother rendering. Do all your edits, do everything you need to do, and then when you're at the end, go ahead and render and then do an export. Now, some people might even tell you this in the comment section down below. Don't render, you don't need to export. That's wrong. And it's what I would call a half-truth. If all you're doing is just a talking head, you don't have any special effects, you don't have any overlays or anything like that, well, yes, that will work. And the software will do the rendering in the background and then the export. You're not really saving any time. However, if, like me, you're using 
graphical overlays or some other special effects like from motion uh, VFX that I use, you go ahead and try and export without rendering. You're going to find that that project is going to error out. You need to render first to apply all those effects properly, those overlays. I've learned that hard lesson several times. So yes, go ahead and render when you're done, then do an export. Uh, if you're using new hardware like this, a render doesn't take very long at all. You're talking about minutes on a 20, 30 minute video. It's pretty, pretty quick. And let's see, anything else? So yeah, so for editing, um, I highly recommend Apple ProRes. It doesn't matter whether you're on Apple or you're using DaVinci Resolve. Um, ProRes 422 is a great codec for editing. It preserves a lot of your color information. It's just truly terrific. And then for export, well, that's really up to you. You've got to consider your audience. Now, for my home videos internal, I'm always exporting to H.265. The files are a whole lot smaller and, well, I like the image better. But for my YouTube channel, well, I export using a YouTube um, a profile and I'm using Compressor. Again, I'm using Apple. I'm using Final Cut Pro. So I always use Compressor first uh, to do what I need to. And then when I'm finished exporting from... Um, words speak me not here, Final Cut, then I'll use Compressor. And I think Compressor works really well. So your, your export codec will really depend on any given scenario. I'm using multiple different ones myself. But that brings us to the end of another AMA session. The only thing I want to talk about in behind the scenes this week is contributions. You'll notice that I've been having Movie Matt contribute to the channel for, what, several months now? Uh, he'll take one question. He goes, oh, Simon, I'd really like to answer this question. Go ahead, knock yourself out. For me, it adds variety to the channel, and it also gives a chance for other channels that are just starting out that have potential to get more exposure. And when I bring Moving Mad or John Drummond or other people into the channel, please do look at their channel. Take a look. The reason I'm bringing and exposing them is because, well, I saw potential in them and in the content that they produce, just like you saw the potential in me when you subscribed wherever when you did, whether it was last year or just a couple of weeks ago. So this week I introduced John Drummond and the reason why is I was having a chat with him during the week and I just went and look at his channel and I was stunned. He had so many videos. He shoots outdoors, which I love. I lo and I'm glad that when he answered the question about the R5C and the R5 in terms of pricing, he was shooting outside because I love the outdoors. And yes, I know I'm shooting inside, but with it's the only way I can get these videos done in the time that I have. I'm basically a video editing machine some days. This is my second video today. Uh, so I, I really liked John Drummond's video. I, I just removed a tiny little bit because of time constraints, but uh, take a look at John's channel as well. And, you know, if you've got a channel, if you've been doing video and you just seem like your channel isn't getting noticed and you've producing a lot of good content, well, reach out to me in the comment section. You know, I'd love to get you to answer a question or two and try it out, see how it goes. And, um, you know, what's the worst that could happen? You know, you don't get any extra subscribers. But next week, I, I, I hope to see a question being answered by OneShot. Uh, when I was chatting with him the earlier today, getting his address so he could get his prize, I said, look, you know, I, I, I can't believe he's, he's got the subscribers he's got with the content he produces. You can just tell from that insert he did earlier today in the video where I talked about the winner, um, he knows how to edit well, he knows how to present himself well, he frames the shot really well. And so I'd love to see him take on a question, I'd love to see him get above a thousand subscribers too. So if you're like me, you like to see people that are upcoming do well and try to give them a bit more exposure, take a visit. Visit John Drummond, visit One Shot and subscribe, like their videos, comment. Um, part of what I'm doing here as a channel, and this is not meant as a money-making machine, this is meant to teach me new skills, it's meant to create a community where we can engage with each other and can share ideas, and if I can help others who are starting up just like I was last year, help get them better exposure, I'm more than happy to do so. But that's it for now. Don't forget to subscribe. Please subscribe for your chance to win two Angelbird 128 gigabyte AV Pro MK2V90 UHS-2 SD cards, and a dual UHS-2 card reader. Or you could also win a Ulanzi LED light package with an accent light, underwater light, and various other flat panel lights that you can use for lighting your subject, or as a great starter kit for starting your own YouTube channel. I'll be awarding these two prize bundles once the channel reaches 30,000 subscribers. And then, once the channel reaches 100,000, I'll be awarding a brand new Canon EOS R5 full-frame mirrorless camera to one lucky viewer. And on that bombshell, Thanks so much for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. Oh, and one last thing. 
I just got word from Creator Stack that the hats are starting to go out. So hopefully you'll be getting your hats by the end of next week. But let me know if you have purchased a hat. If you have any problems, please reach out to me. Uh, this is a new service we're trying out. We're working with new vendors. So if you're having any problems whatsoever, please reach out to me. More than one way to do that, you can reach out to me on my Facebook page. Uh, another great way to get a hold of me is in the comments of the first video that I put out, uh, especially when, as soon as I first put a video out. I'm usually on there for the first half an hour, an hour, answering questions. So that's usually the best way to get to me. Facebook, I check in every day or two. So if you send me a question, you, you send me a comment, I don't respond right away. Don't think that's because I'm ignoring you. It's just because I've got a lot to do. I've got a family, got a daytime job, and this is job number three. Thanks again for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. We'll see you again soon.